Purging is a very strong mechanic in Keyforge, permanently ridding cards from players' decks and rendering those cards inaccessible for the remainder of the game. In fact, there's only one card in the entirety of Keyforge that can get purged cards back, and that's the Rare Logos Artifact Universal Recycle Bin, which archives them one at a time. Permanently losing key pieces of your deck can be utterly crippling to your deck's game plan, and your gameplay in general, and it's for this reason that purging isn't seen very often, showing up on only 50 of the over 1400 cards in Keyforge, with over half of them being rares. Today, we'll be taking a look at the purge mechanic and how it's evolved over the game's history, and we'll start off by looking at each card that purges something in one way or another, starting with Call of the Archons. I believe House Dis has the richest history in terms of purging, so let's begin with them. In Coda, Dis had five cards that could purge, the most of any house at the time. First we have Creeping Oblivion, which simply lets you purge up to two cards from a discard pile. This sort of targeted purging is great for getting rid of important items in your opponent's deck, and it was one of only two cards that let you purge something out of a discard pile. The other was Eater of the Dead, who grew stronger and stronger the more creatures it purged. And as we all know, Creeping Oblivion would later evolve into one of Keyforge's most infamous creatures, but we're not there just yet. Another disc creature that purged was Stealer of Souls, that not only purges the creature it destroys in a fight, but also gains Ember for doing it, making him a source of deck control, board control, and Ember generation all in one, making him quite the threat. We also have Annihilation Ritual, which can be game warping. Annihilation Ritual reads, when a creature would enter a discard pile from play, it is purged instead. The last purging coded discard is kind of a funny one, that of Sacrificial Altar. This is one of the first examples of something that lets you purge your own cards for some sort of benefit. In this case, getting to play a creature from your discard pile. This card is known for appearing in decks that don't have any human creatures in them, making it totally useless, and even in decks where there are humans, it's still not that potent of a card. The house and call of the Archons with the next highest amount of purging cards was Shadows, possessing 4. First they had Oubliette, which quite simply allowed you to purge a creature with 3 or less power. They also have Special Delivery, which reads Omni, Sacrifice Special Delivery, deal 3 damage to a flank creature. If this damage destroys that creature, purge it. Then we have One Last Job, a Shadows action with loads of potential and Shadows flavor, reading Purge each friendly Shadows creature. Steal 1 Ember for each creature purged this way. Played in ideal circumstances, One Last Job can result in a huge steal, swinging the game massively. And the creatures you purge don't even have to be ready, meaning you can use your Shadows creatures for stealing or whatever else first, then play One Last Job. The last Shadows card is Imperial Traitor, a very situational action that reads, look at your opponent's hand, you may choose and purge a Sanctum card from it. The ability to look at your opponent's hand is tremendously beneficial in any scenario. It's the purging of the Sanctum card that's situational. If your opponent doesn't have Sanctum in their deck, you won't get to do the second part of the effect. And that does it for Shadows. From Call of the Archons onwards, those are all the Shadows cards that purge, no more are added later on. There is one single Sanctum card that purges in Coda, called The Harder They Come, which purges a creature with 5 or more power, sort of the other end of the spectrum compared to Oubliette. House Logos has two cards that deal with purging. First is a card that purges itself, Library Access, a card so incredibly powerful that it needed to be eroded, and that errata came in the form of it being purged upon play. The second card is Spangler Box, a really weird artifact that reads, Action, purge a creature in play. If you do, your opponent gains control of Spangler Box. If Spangler Box leaves play, return to play all cards purged by Spangler Box. But the purging in this case isn't permanent, since if either player has artifact control, Spangler Box's destruction results in the purged cards returning to play, making it a temporary solution to problem creatures. The last house in Coda with purging cards is House Mars. Brabnar and Untamed don't have any. Mars has some pretty entertaining stuff. First is a wacky card called Martians Make Bad Allies, which reads, play, reveal your hand. Purge each revealed non-Mars creature and gain one ember for each card purged this way. This card begins a trend of Mars tending to purge your own deck, and the results are oftentimes somewhat questionable. With lots of low-value creatures in your hand, Martians Make Bad Allies can herald a decent amount of ember, but it's kind of an odd and situational way of obtaining it. Then again, that's just sort of how Mars functions in the first place. Mars also has Yuxilla Bolter, who deals 2 damage to a creature whenever he fights or reaps, and if that damage destroys the creature, it gets purged. He's great for dealing with those pesky little Shadows or Star Lions creatures, or bigger creatures if you can use other Mars creatures to whittle them down beforehand. The last card for Call of the Archons is a simply awful artifact, Custom Virus. Custom Virus provides some incredibly convoluted board control that involves traits and purging your own cards, and I feel like in most cases will end up being more effective in clearing your own side of the board than your opponent's. 
But that rounds out Call of the Archons in terms of cards that purge, and things just get even more exciting moving into Age of Ascension, especially for House Mars. Custom Virus returns for Age of Ascension, and Mars is given two more cards that purge, both of them continuing the pattern of Mars purging your own deck. First is Destructive Analysis, a wacky action that reads, deal 2 damage to a creature. You may purge any number of cards from your archives to deal an additional 2 damage to the same creature for each card purged this way. This card requires you to have archives in the first place to maximize its value, otherwise it's only dealing 2 damage. And this means you'll want to be archiving cards of lower value throughout the game to set up for an effective destructive analysis play later on, which seems like a lot of effort to not only get your own cards purged, cards that you just spent time archiving, but also to deal 6, maybe 8 damage to a creature. I don't know what it is about Mars and purging archives, but the next card does just that. Yizfiz No Drone reads, play, archive a card. You may purge an archived card. If you do, stun a creature. Once again, just like Mars to do things in the most complicated and roundabout way possible, this time taking two whole extra steps just to stun a single creature. This card is neat, however, in that you can purge your opponent's archived cards if they happen to have any, which can be both crippling and surprising. And unlike Destructive Analysis, at least this one gives you some ammo to use when you play it, instead of relying on other cards to build up your archives. House Dis wasn't given any new Purge cards in Age of Ascension, though both Creeping Oblivion and Eater of the Dead were reprinted. The same goes for Shadows, in which was reprinted Oubliette and Special Delivery. Meanwhile, House Sanctum, in addition to the Harder They Come being reprinted, received a new Purge card in the form of Eye of Judgment, an okay artifact that lets you purge a creature from a discard pile. And lastly for AOA, Untamed received its first Purge card in the form of Soldiers to Flowers. This is honestly a pretty decent burst card that reads, purge each untamed creature from each player's discard pile. For each card purged this way, its owner gains one ember. Against decks with no untamed, Soldiers to Flowers only affects yourself, and with the relatively middling creatures found in AOA Untamed, purging your own untamed creatures isn't often a real detriment, especially with how well it leads into a key charge. And now we move from Age of Ascension to Worlds Collide. And this is the set where Purging really took off and found its place within Keyforge, with the entire meta of House Dis revolving mostly around Purging, along with a few other funky points of disruption. In Call of the Archons, there were 15 cards that purged. In Age of Ascension, there were 10. And in Worlds Clyde, there were 19, with a whopping 12 of them belonging to Dis, two of those 12 reprinted again from Age of Ascension. Let's start things off with the card that has, since its arrival, become a staple of any halfway decent Dis deck the infamous evolution of Creeping Oblivion, Infernus. If you've been around Keyforge for much time at all, you've surely experienced the pain of Infernus more than once, and it's never a pleasant experience. This card changed Keyforge forever when it was first printed in Worlds Collide, and there are plenty of places around the internet where its viciousness is described in great detail. It provides Ember Control and Deck Control simultaneously, doing what Creeping Oblivion does but better, and in multiples, and comboing with cards such as Hysteria, Exhume, and Stirring Grave. Decks that rely on the Ember bonus icons on their cards to generate Ember tremble in the presence of Infernus. And decks that win due to powerful combos are slowly picked apart by this card, taking away their critical combo pieces until there's nothing of value left. Infernus was the card designed to counter the classic untamed rush of Call of the Archons, transforming key rush elements into liabilities rather than assets. Dust Pixies, Fertility Chance, and Ghostly Hands are all prime targets of Infernus's abilities, and it doesn't help that either discard pile is fair game. Anyway, moving on from Infernus, let's take a look at the other discards that can purge in Worlds Collide. Paired thematically, though not in deck appearance, are Lesser and Greater Oxtit. Both purge cards out of your hand to give you a bonus. For Lesser Oxtit, it's making keys cost plus 3 whenever you reap with them, and Greater Oxtit gets gradually boosted in power at the end of your turns. They're not great cards, but can make for some interesting scenarios. The same goes for No Name, who gets plus one power for every purged card belonging to either player, and purges a card from a discard pile when he's played, and then whenever he fights or reaps. Another popular disc creature came in the form of Imp Specter, who purges a random card from the opponent's hand when it's destroyed. Recurrable, and showing up in multiples, Imp Specter is a classic disruption card that can really hinder your opponent. If it manages to hit a card the opponent is relying on, that's even better. There's also Buzzle, a fighting machine that can mow through entire battle lines, purging your lineup to fight into the opponents. There are a number of creatures in the Worlds Collide Dis that can act as fantastic fodder for Buzzle to burn through to continue fighting. We also have Bornit, who's an immense threat when he hits the table. He reads, reveal the top 5 cards of a player's deck. Purge a card revealed this way. Shuffle the other revealed cards into that deck. Being able to purge something that's coming up in the opponent's deck, 
a potential future threat is hugely advantageous, especially since you get free choice of any of the 5 cards Bornet reveals. However, since Bornet is only a 3 power creature, he's pretty easy to take off the board. But there is an alternative, Bornet's Touch, which is an action with the exact same effect as Bornet, guaranteeing you the chance to use it. Whereas with Bornet, you only get the effect if he survives, but is repeatable if he does, with Bornet's Touch you are guaranteed the effect once. There are two more discards and worlds collide that purge, the first of which is the elusive EE on the fringes, offering some steel in a house that doesn't usually steal. His text box is so fun to read, I just have to read it out here. It says, During your turn, after you discard a discard from your hand, you may purge a discard from a discard pile. If you do, steal one ember. Since EE's effect is a passive effect, you can utilize it as soon as he hits the board, and that can result in some pretty massive steals, in addition to thinning out your own hand and deck. Or if the opponent is also playing a disc deck, you can purge threats from their discard pile and steal ember for doing so. The last discard for Worlds Collide is the incredible Harvest Time. Harvest Time reads, play, choose a trait, purge each card with that trait. Each player gains one ember for each card they controlled that was purged this way. Under ideal circumstances, you could purge your entire battle line for a massive ember burst, or take care of problematic creatures your opponent controls. Something to remember about Harvest Time is that artifacts have traits too, meaning that you can purge artifacts using this card as well, increasing its versatility even more. It's also one of the only cards that can one-shot the Kuraken, in case you're wondering. Now we're finally out of this! I mentioned this card at the start of the video, but Universal Recycle Bin is the one card that returns purged cards to play, not counting things like Spangler Box, which are more of temporary purges than true purges. Oubliette and Special Delivery return to Shadows from Age of Ascension, and are welcome inclusions. Brabnar has the two card pair Igon the Green and Igon the Terrible, but the purging only happens within their own functionality. Igon the Terrible can only remain in the battle line once Igon the Green has been purged. There is also Crassosaurus, who only purges himself if he fails to capture 10 Ember upon play. And lastly, we have one of the 10 anomalies introduced in Worlds Collide, the Grim Reaper. He implements the Haunted keyword, which is a mechanic that will supposedly show up in a future set. He reads, if you are haunted, the Grim Reaper enters play ready. Reap, purge an enemy creature and a friendly creature. He offers some pretty decent targeted removal, and can do so instantly if you have 10 or more cards in your discard pile. And now, we can finally transition from Worlds Collide to Mass Mutation, which has 13 cards that interact with Purging. In House Dis, nothing new is added, and only 3 cards return, those of Harvest Time, Imp Spectre, and Infernus. Shadows reprints Imperial Traitor and One Last Job. For Sanctum, Eye of Judgment is reprinted from Age of Ascension, and is given 3 new Purge cards. First is Fangs of Gizelheart, which simply purges the most powerful creature. There's also Purify, which is just a really weird card that targets mutant creatures and replaces them with any non-mutant creature, and Book of Malfaction, which not only purges creatures, but also possesses its very own unique counter, the Warrant Counter. Book of Malfaction builds up Warrant Counters via the opponent stealing your Ember, and you can purge a creature once per turn by using the artifact's Omni ability. In some matchups, it does a lot of work, and in other matchups, it's utterly useless, so it really comes down to the sort of deck you're playing against. House Logos was given two brand new purge cards. Well, three if you count library card, but that just purges itself once you choose to use it. First we have Cyberclone, which reads, play, purge another creature. Until Cyberclone leaves play, it has power equal to the purged creature's power, and gains that creature's armor, keywords, and traits. Cyberclone effectively becomes a doppelganger of the creature it purges, just without its abilities. What makes it really shine is its ability to purge whatever creature it wants without consequence. The fact that it copies them afterwards is just an added bonus. The other Logos card is Ultra Gravitron, one of the three gigantic creatures featured in Mass Mutation. It reads, play, archive the top five cards of your deck. Fight Reap, discard a card from your archives. If you do, purge a creature and resolve each of its bonus icons as if you had played it. There are just not enough good things to say about Ultra Gravitron. As if archiving five whole cards off the top of your deck wasn't enough, he essentially loads himself up with ammo to purge threats off the table with pretty much allowing you 5 shots before he runs dry, and that's without all the other cards and logos that can add to your archives on top of that. And even if Ultra Gravitron does get destroyed before you have the chance to use his Fight Reap effect, at least you then still have a massive archive to pick up on a later turn. He's the infinitely, exponentially better version of Yzfiz Nodrone. And the last card for Mass Mutation is an Untamed, Reclaimed by Nature. Reclaimed by Nature lets you purge an artifact and resolve its bonus icons as if you had played it, taking advantage of the enhancements found everywhere in Mass Mutation. It's one of the best artifact control cards in the game, right up there with Hawk and Mollymawk in my opinion. There's only one set left, Dark Tidings. 
Shockingly, the only reprints that show up in this set are Library Card and Logos, and Crassosaurus and Saurian, both of which just purge themselves. Everything else is brand new. In Logos, we have Think Twice, which lets you play an action card straight out of your discard pile, and then purge it, a balanced price for such a strong effect. There's also Honor's Kesis, a really solid key cheat that's strong enough that it gets purged once you've played it, only allowing you to play it once per game. There's Groundbreaking Discovery, an action that always comes with Dr. Varachter, Ruckless Experimentation, and Rooftop Laboratory. And last for Logos is Forgive or Forget, one of the classic Dark Tidings choice cards that presents you with the option of either archiving two cards of different types from your discard pile, or purging up to two cards from a discard pile. Sanctum has a brand new purge card in the form of First or Last, another choice card that lets you either purge each creature with the lowest power, or each creature with the highest power. Obviously, timing is key when playing this card, to ensure you don't hurt yourself more than the opponent, and sometimes you may just have to end up discarding it. Storian was given two new purge cards, the first of which is Ostracize, letting you lose one ember to purge a creature. The other is Swallow Hole, a really weird action that you can only play when the tide is high, and reads, choose two creatures, purge the chosen creature with the lowest power, and give plus one power counters equal to its power to the other chosen creature. The last two purge cards in the game come from House Unfathomable, and one of them just purges itself, Dark Discovery. It's another one of those key cheats that's powerful to the point that you can only use it once, and it gets purged when you play it. The other unfathomable card is a bizarre creature called General Sherman, who reads, General Sherman deals no damage when fighting. Play, purge each other creature. If General Sherman leaves play, return to play each creature purged this way, exhausted and under its owner's control. Once you get over the initial shock factor of this card, you realize he's kinda like Spangler Box, although he purges everything all at once instead of one creature at a time. So now that we've taken a closer look at each card throughout Keyforge that interacts with purging in one way or another, we can get a better picture of how purging has truly evolved throughout the sets as a mechanic. Clearly it's changed quite a bit, going from something seen very little to an entire house-defining playstyle. In many cases, it's used as an offensive mechanic, manipulating the opponent's deck and disrupting their game plan. But in many other cases, it seems to be something of a price-reward mechanic, where you pay the price of purging something from your own deck in order to gain some benefit. If we look at Call of the Archons again, we see that many of the purge cards there are used in an aggressive fashion. Most of the cards are meant to go after the opponent in some way, either purging cards from their discard pile, or purging creatures straight from the battle line. The exception is with House Mars, which, as always, does things very differently. There are also the cards so strong that they purge themselves, such as Library Access, and later Library Card, and Key Cheats such as Honor's Kesis and Dark Discovery. It's in cards like Sacrificial Altar and One Last Job where we see the trend of self-purging for a reward get its start. In Age of Ascension, more cards are added that continue this trend. Destructive Analysis, Yizfiz No Drone, and Soldiers of Flowers all force you to pay a price for their benefit. Clearly in Age of Ascension this trend hasn't been mastered yet, since the two Mars cards I mentioned really aren't all that good and don't seem worth it in the long run. But as I said before, I think Worlds Collide is where purging really found an excellent balance with House Dis revolving primarily around purging, and the designers have only continued to perfect it from there. It's interesting to see an entire house with something like purging as such a prevalent mechanic, and Dis utilized it in some really cool and unique ways. In Worlds Collide, Dis was filled with a lot of mediocre creatures and actions that acted as fuel for these purge cards. Malison, Lilithal, Dendrix, Edorome, Three Fates, Orb of Invidious, and all the different Bane cards didn't matter all too much in the long run, and could be purged without too much consequence. This reinforces the idea that purging evolved into a price, allowing you to reap the benefits of cards like Lesser Oxtit or E.E. on the Fringes if you purge something first. Of course, this concept fell flat in some areas, such as with the Igon pair, or Greater Oxtit for many people, but overall, it felt balanced and offered a unique twist. Mass Mutation, on the other hand, seemed to shake this formula up a little bit, and returned to Coda's roots of offensive purging. With the introduction of cards like Cyberclone, Fangs of Gizelheart, Book of Malfaction, and Reclaimed by Nature, things were simpler again, and the only cards that really implemented the price-reward strategy of purging were cards like One Last Job. Dark Tidings picked up where Worlds Clyde left off, printing new cards that really made you think. Ostracize, Think Twice, and First or Last are cards that really encapsulate the concept we've been talking about. Many of the other cards are, once again, cards that just purge themselves, but overall, there's lots of strategic purging rather than just purging whatever happens to be the primary threat at the moment. I think purging is a really cool mechanic, and I hope it's something that can continue to be implemented in new and unique ways in the sets to come. It's not always the most impactful mechanic, but under ideal circumstances it can be absolutely ruinous, or beneficial. 
Let me know what your thoughts are on purging and the way it's evolved. I'm sure there are some points I probably missed and I would love to see them brought up. Thank you all so much for watching and I can't wait to see you all again in the next one. See you later.